Bonjour. <laughs> That's all I got. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's about it. Um, <laughs> good morning. Uh, I'm very excited to be here in Quebec. Uh, I'm sorry I do not speak French, but I do speak English like a New Yorker. So that means I'm going to try to slow down for this. Um, I'm very excited to be here. It's my first time in Quebec. It's only an hour from New York. Did you know that? It's an hour and a half to get to New York from here by plane, which is great. Uh, I've been here since Saturday, kind of exploring the city, getting to, getting to know the lay of the land, staying in the old town. It's absolutely beautiful. So I'm really excited to be here, and wow, there's so many of you. Uh, it's really exciting to see such a huge, agile group up here in uh, Canada. So today, I'm going to talk to you about what I'm really passionate about and what I love about agile, which has to do with product management. And I feel like it's a little bit of an under-talked about thing in, in Agile. What do we do with the product managers? What do we do with the product owners? So I want to tell you today about a common scenario that we all get into called the build trap and how we might be able to get out of it. So when I started out as a product manager about 10 years ago, I didn't really know what that meant. I was studying engineering at Cornell, and I had been doing a lot of graphic design for the marketing team at Cornell as well. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I could code, but I didn't really want to. And I didn't want to work in supply chain management because working in a factory didn't sound appealing for me. And one day, I talked to a friend who was working at a company um, that did a research platform for banks. So it was a software company. And he said, oh, just talk to our hiring manager. And I explained my background. And he went, oh, you're an engineer and you can design? you can be a product manager. I was like, what is that? <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but okay, sign me up. So that's how I ended up in product management, um, like a lot of us do. We all kind of fall into that role. And when I came in to work for the company, they told me, your job is to go to all the salespeople, gather all the requirements for what they want, turn them into these lovely specification documents, and then ship them off to engineers. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And man, was I good at that. My first, one of my first specification documents I ever wrote was 21 pages to change your password. I was really, really good at writing specification documents. And my bosses loved it. They were like, wow, this is so detailed. Look at it, it's beautiful. Like you're such a good product manager. And I thought, yes, I got this. I am a good product manager. Little did I know, not everybody was on board with those types of work. So as I kept progressing with my career, I went to um, another company. And I got brought in by the same person who hired me at that previous company. And he said, I need you to do the same thing. Write out the specification documents, hand it off to the engineers, go away for three months, come back and make sure it's OK. And I went into this team, approached it exactly the same way that I did before. and. When I, when I gave it to them, it was very different. I had written up all these specification documents, shipped it off to the engineers, came back a month later, and when I looked at it, it wasn't anything like what I wrote. And they were like, oh, I didn't read that. It was 21 pages long. Why would I read your specification document? So I started to think, OK, if my role isn't to write these beautiful documents, what is it? What am I supposed to do? So at this time, we were trying to, we were all frustrated with each other, working together, the developers, me, everybody. And we were trying to find a better way. And at that time, um, I was in luck because I was told that it was time to burn all my specification documents because we were going agile. So uh, one of the engineers on my team, he said, there's this new thing, it wasn't very new, but there's this new thing called Agile. I'm actually a Scrum master, and even though I've been sitting here pretending to be a database engineer, I'm also a Scrum master, and I want to teach you guys this thing called Scrum. And we said, you know what? Anything's better than what we're doing now, because we really hate each other. So if you can make us work better together, we're on board. So he sat us down, and it was a very informal thing. He was like, this is what Scrum does, here's the cadences, here we go. And we really liked it. We started working better together. We started using just the basic practices of Scrum, made our product backlog, started working in two-week sprints, and we loved it. 
And it worked really, really well for us because we started collaborating. We started getting used to each other. We started talking to each other instead of me writing everything up in a corner and then shipping it off to the developers. So this worked really, really well for us um, for a couple of months. And then as we got better at working at with each other, we started to realize something though. Um, my focus started shifting from making sure the developers were doing everything that we needed to do and more looking at what were the outcomes of what we were actually doing. And when I started to do that, I started to dig into the analytics of the products that we were making. So I remember one time we made this beautiful dashboard, this huge um, admin section for all the people who we who uh, sold products on our site. So we were an e-commerce company at the time. We had 100 different sellers who were all celebrities uh, selling things on our platform. And they said, I need to see what I'm selling. I need more information. So we specced out and made this beautiful thing and shipped it to them over the course of three months. We used Scrum, we used our processes, and everything was great. And when I shipped it, I started looking into the analytics. It was the first time I used Google Analytics. And I started watching and waiting for them to log in. And I thought I had done a really good job getting the requirements. I met with them, I asked them what they needed, I wrote down their needs, I spec'd it all out, I showed them some prototypes. And when I shipped it out to them though, we found out nobody was logging into our site. Nobody was using it. And when I went and asked them why, they were like, what is all this? You gave me everything, and I need two pieces of information. So I had done a really poor job, it turns out, actually going through the requirements and figuring out what do they actually need. I had spent all my time trying to give them everything they asked for instead of testing what they needed, and we wasted a lot of time. So our users weren't using our products, and that's the first time it really dawned on me that my job was to make sure we were satisfying the customer and to make sure that we were reaching our outcomes with our products. But this is a really hard thing in Agile for a lot of teams, and it's something that we neglect to do. And it causes a lot of frustration in the product management world. So last year, I was um, speaking at Mind the Product, and I was in the audience with uh, Jeff Patton. And we were sitting down there watching David Cancel, who is a big product management guru in Boston. And he gets up to give his talk, and he says something really snarky, and he goes, I hate Agile, but I'm not going to get into that. And then the whole room starts to giggle. They're like, hee, 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 hee. Um, and he goes, OK, well, we, maybe I will get into that. So he goes, I hate Agile. It's all story points and velocity, and nobody cares about the user. And 1,000 product managers got up and started applauding him. And Jeff and I looked at each other and went, oh crap, we have a problem. <laughs> if this is how all the product managers feel about Agile, something is wrong here. And this is something that I hear from so many people in product management. I hate Agile. They just care about velocity. They only care about story points. They don't care about the user. Nobody focuses on outcomes. And to me, that was a little confusing for a while, because when I started with Agile, we did a really good job focusing on the user. We changed our practice early on. But I see a lot of companies not do this because they get too caught up in the motions of Agile. So now I come in to help train companies that are going through Agile transformations to focus on product managers. And what I observe is that everybody is doing this kind of safety dance, right? And what I mean by that is they're, they're like following all the motions, following the leader, but they don't really know why they're doing these moves. And this is happening everywhere, and no matter what you use, whether it's a safe or a scrum or anything like that. But we have so many people all caught up doing these motions, but not understanding why they're doing the rituals and the ceremonies and the meetings behind it. And what happens then is that we end up taking a lot of stuff and putting it out to our customers, and things get really complex. So, you know, what started off as a really good um, product becomes overloaded with features, like this thing, right? What started off as a printer became a copier, and then a printer, and then a scanner, and then a fax machine, and then a stapler, and then everything else. And at the end of the day, none of it works, right? Like, how many times have you sat at the copy machine trying to make it work? 
I have spent countless hours trying to copy something. <laughs> so we take all these things, we get really good at putting them out there, and then it gets overcomplicated for our users. So we end up with these um, hodgepodge of complexity, and these types of things are still relevant from 1999, right? We still hate all these complicated products. So we keep adding and adding to these backlogs, but we never manage to take anything away. And we end up with such complex products, and we get very excited about our velocity and how fast we ship things, but we don't actually think about if they're usable for our users. So at this point is usually where I come in. And I get a company that's been doing Scrum or doing some kind of agile process, and they come to me and they say, you know what our problem is? We have to train our product owners. And I say, great, that is a good place to start. All product managers should know what they're supposed to be doing. They should be focused on their customers. So I'll go in and I'll train them and I'll, I'll talk to them and I'll do a workshop with them. I'll try to teach them about outcomes and how you should be looking at your metrics and looking at the goals. And what happens is all these product managers come up to me after my workshops or my training and go, I love everything you're saying. I want to test things, I want to make our users happy, but I spend 40 hours a week writing user stories. If you're spending 40 hours a week writing user stories, what are you doing? How many features are you actually writing there? But they were told that their job was to write user stories, to manage the backlog, to do these types of roles, not to produce awesome things. So they focus on that, and what happens is we end up in this loop where everybody's like, what is all this? And we ship it all out really fast, and users don't use it. So that is what I call the build trap, right? We're shipping feature after feature and concentrating on velocity rather than what makes our users happy, what produces outcomes for both our business and our users. And that's really where we should be focusing. So to get out of the build trap, we need to focus there. But there are some flaws that we have in the way that we train people in Agile. So how did we get here? How did we end up in this place where all we care about is shipping features and doing that as fast as possible? Where did this start and where does this come from? Well, one thing to remember is that Agile processes don't have a brain. And what I mean by that is that Agile, Scrum, all those development processes were made to optimize the flow of work out through development. None of them actually talk about what should be going in to your development process. None of them actually talk about how to make a great backlog if you go to any of those trainings. So we have to stop and think about what are we putting in there and how are we communicating that? And a lot of that gets lost in translation. So when you do look at what a product owner should be doing and who that product owner is, it gets really confusing for a lot of people who are new to software development, especially people going through these transitions in non-traditional um, non software companies. So one of the first times I heard about a product owner, people were telling me that it was a customer, and I was really confused, because I came out of a background that was more Silicon Valley-ish, and product managers were a specific role that represented the customer, but also balanced the business. So I went back and I looked at this, and Ken Schwaber did write for the first time in 2004, kind of a defined thing about the product owner. He says, Scrum doesn't focus on delivering just any increment of business value. It focuses on delivering the highest priority business value as defined by the customer, product owner. To me, that was really confusing because now we're saying that the customer is the person managing the backlog. So I dug into this and I started asking people who were there signing the Agile Manifesto where a lot of this came from. And when you go back into the history of the Agile Manifesto, what you find is that at the time when they built um, those practices or when they were trying to implement them, the product owner was the customer. But the product owner was an internal person in a company, and the people doing the work, the developers, were consultants. So it changes the dynamic a little bit. So this customer inside the business was a business person. They weren't the end user at the end of the day most of the time. And they had pushed the responsibility of prioritizing the backlog onto the customer so that they were building what they want, which is a little different than how we build things today. And it's very confusing for people first getting into Agile with no background in product management about what they should be doing. So when I looked at the principles behind the Agile Manifesto, I got really confused because for me, when everybody was complaining about Agile, 
this always made sense to me. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Now, I always saw the customer as the person on the end, somebody you sold something to at the end of the day. And when you flip that and think of how they created some of these process, processes as consultants, it gets a little confusing, right? You start to see where maybe these activities came up and maybe where some of the misunderstandings of product owners really came from. So this is an issue for so many people out there just learning about how to do product management today through product owner training. So the moral of this story is that Agile is not enough. It's not enough to build excellent products for our user. And we need more. And what we need is good product management. You need to have a good product management brain on your Agile process to ship things that are great for your users. But we run into a few obstacles when we're actually trying to implement great product management in companies. So I want to walk you through three of those big obstacles today. So what I want you to remember throughout all of this, though, is what is good product management? Sometimes we forget this, and we consider development just a linear process, right? Specify what you want, write the user story, put it in the backlog, code it, ship it, ta-da, we're done. Hopefully we iterate, but everybody in here, I bet you, knows that not always do we iterate, right? Those are the things we forget to do. So what we have to start thinking about with product management, with software, is that it's a system. So at the end of the day, you have customers and you have business. And the customers, there we go. Um, the customers have problems, wants, and needs, and the business creates products or services to fill those problems, wants, and needs. But not until we actually solve those wants and needs, do the customers realize value? And in return, do they give value back to the business? Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble here. Um, in the form of money. And then we realize value. So this sounds really simple, but what happens is we don't really work to optimize this system. Instead, we treat it as a one-way thing where we just ship features out to um, customers and don't stop to measure if there's actual value in it at the end of the day. So we want to figure out how do we optimize this. If you don't fulfill those wants or needs, they don't get any value. So how do we measure that? How do we remember that at the end of the day? So one of the biggest problems I see is that we treat product strategy as a plan. So I was working with one company last year and they um, they were a meal delivery kit. So they shipped ingredients and recipes to your door. So what happened is you go online, you find what meals you want, um, and they ship you a box once a week with all the ingredients, pre-packaged and pre-portioned, and the recipes to cook them. And they were delicious, good meals. And when I came in there, um, they had a specific goal. They wanted to increase their acquisition. So they had worked a lot on retention, they had a lot of loyal customers, but they had to get more people in the door. So I was working with their team, we were teaching them product management and agile, trying to figure out how do we increase acquisition. And they had some really lofty goals to try to double that by the end of the year. And about halfway into my engagement there, we were sitting down discussing some of the experiments we were running. And the CTO, who was um, a former employee of Amazon, he came in and he sat down and he said, okay, he just interrupted my meeting, um, sits down and goes, what is your product strategy? And I try to explain to him, we don't know why people are not signing up yet, like we're running these experiments, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. And he goes, no, 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 that's not a product strategy. What I want you to do is create a document for me with all the requirements on the front end of the site so I can go back and build a content system. And I was like, what does that have to do with anything? Like we have no idea if we should even build a content system. But what he was asking for here is not a strategy. He was asking for a plan. And this is a really common mistake most people make. Most people consider product strategies a wish list of features. What are you gonna build and when? And then what we do is take that wish list and we shove it into a roadmap that's really a Gantt chart. And it says, we're gonna ship this feature with all these specifications in September. And as we all know, that usually doesn't happen. We miss September and we go on. And we don't know if we're successful, even if we rush to get it done in September. But this is not strategy. This is not strategy at all. This is a plan and a wish list. So we have to recognize to get out of this that creating new products is full of uncertainty. And when you treat product strategy as a plan, 
you don't recognize this. When we first start building anything, we have so many questions that we need to ask. Will our users like this? What problem do they have? Where are they experiencing the problem? What is the context around the problem? What are they trying now to solve it? How can we best put out a solution? And if we don't recognize that uncertainty of whether or not this is going to help us reach our goals or satisfy the user, we're just fooling ourselves because we can't make a great product. So we have to treat strategy as what it really is when it comes to products and software development. So Stephen Bungay, who wrote The Art of Action, anybody read The Art of Action here? No? OK, great book, all about strategy deployment. Stephen Bungay, he's an expert on strategy. And he says, strategy is a deployable decision-making framework enabling action to achieve desired outcomes constrained by current capabilities coherently aligned to the existing context. So what does that mean? That means strategy should enable your product teams to make decisions and work autonomously. That's really what it's for. And a good product strategy enables you to change your tactics to reach your goals as you go. Plans don't do that. So when I think of strategy, I try to explain it using something from Bill Constantino and Mike Rother, who did Toyota Kata. And they wrote something called the unified field theory. So when you think of strategy, it's a process. It's this decision-making framework that helps you step towards your goals. And when you develop products, it's the same type of thinking. So normally, when you start out, we might have something which is called the current state. That's where we are right now. Then we have the challenge, which is the first big goal we want to achieve to reach a vision. And then we have our product vision or our company vision at the end of the day. And what we do is we first start by figuring out where we are and what are all the problems standing in our way of reaching that first goal. So we look at the problems that we have to solve, the improvements we have to make, the feature ideas, and we look through it and try to figure out which path to take. But there is a current threshold of knowledge. There's only so much that we know. There's only so much we could know before we get started. And we have to recognize that there's uncertainty lying out there. So what we do is we set a smaller goal, we break down that big goal into something that's achievable, and we navigate our way through this unclear territory through experimentation, tackling these problems along the way in order to reach our target condition. And when we do that, we get closer to our goal. Our current state moves, and we have made some progress. So we do step-by-step -step implementation in order to achieve the big visions. So that sounds great, but how does it work in practice? With my teams, I use something called the Product Strategy Canvas, where we kind of align up the vision, the challenge, and the target conditions. So here, they set the vision for the company, which is where they want to go in the future. So I always tell my people, pretend it's five years from now, three years, whatever time frame you want to use. Wait, you wake up, you're a customer of your company. What's your life look like? How is it better for using your product? What's the value you're providing for them? This is where you want to get to in the future. This is what you want to be. What does your company look like? How have you changed the market? What does the market look like? This is your vision. This is not where you are today. This is where you want to go. The challenge, we say, in order to reach this vision, we need to accomplish these things by this date. And the target condition breaks down the challenge, saying, first, we need to do this. And then we have the current condition, which is where we are today. So when our CTO asked us at that company, what is your product strategy? we were actually implementing this. And the way to describe it is as follows. We've got these ingredients and recipes shipped to your door, right? So in the future, our CEO had said, we want to be a top dinner option for the target market. We don't want to replace grocery stores. We want to be a super convenient, uh, con that's a weird word. We want to be very, uh, we want to be very available. We want people to go be able to pick up our meal kits anywhere they would want to, to cook these things. But we want to be the Tuesday, Thursday option. We don't want to replace grocery stores. We don't want to replace making your own salads. You know, we want to be a standard Tuesday, Thursday option where you can get our food, delicious food, anywhere you want. So this is what they were trying to describe as our vision of where you were going at the end of the day. The challenge that we first had to do to get there was to double acquisition. That means we had to start doubling the rate of people signing up. And we had to do that because we needed money <laughs> at the end of the day. So this was a big thing to keep in business. So now that that's set, our team started to get to work and started to figure out how do we double acquisition. Oops. OK, 
So when we double acquisition, sorry. So here, the first two things that we look at, right? Those visions and the challenge, that's set by the product leaders. And then they get out of the way and let the team do their job. That's how you get autonomous teams, so. You can't have high autonomy, and we like to talk about autonomy in Agile, without having direction. So product leads set the vision, the goals, and the guardrails, and then get out of the way and let their teams do the work. Let them figure out how to achieve that. And when you coherently ally align your teams that way, you can give them the freedom to move, because everybody's moving in the same direction. So we got to work trying to figure out what is our first goal we have to reach. And there were so many ideas when we got there. Marketing had ideas, sales had ideas, everybody had ideas, lots of ideas. You never lack for ideas. So a lot of people said, the price is too high, we should lower it. The head of marketing was saying, we should give people free knives. Let's put a knife in the box. So when they open it, they get a free knife. That sounded incredibly dangerous to me. <laughs> I didn't want people all over America opening up knives in boxes. Another one, they can't try it for free. That's the problem. If they tried it for free, everybody would be ordering it. Um, or another one that we hear a lot, it's not beautiful enough. We have to rebrand everything. We have to make it more gorgeous. That's why people aren't signing up. So when you look at all of these ideas, they're not bad ideas, but the problem was we didn't understand the problem. So these are all solutions to an unknown problem. We still have no idea why people aren't signing up. And if you look at these problems, they're all marketing problems. They're all about trying to get people attracted to your site. So what we did is we took a step back and we analyzed the data we did have. And we found that the conversion rate was a low thing. So everybody's coming to our site, thousands of people are landing on it. Nobody is getting past one step in our conversion funnel. They're ending up in it, but they're not continuing. And I thought they would fall off at where you pay, right? Most people think they're gonna fall off where you pay, but they weren't. They were falling off before that, which made it really, really interesting and really confusing for me why that was happening. So we said, actually, we don't have to spend any more money on marketing. We've got commercials that are really good. We've got some good advertisement. We just have to get people to convert when they land there, and we have to figure out why they're leaving. So we said, if we can increase our conversion rate by a certain percent, we can get our double acquisition, just like that. So the conversion rate was the problem, the business problem. So now we have our product strategy. We said in five years, we've got this vision of where we're gonna be available everywhere, everybody can buy us. We got a double acquisition to stay afloat. First thing we need to do is to increase the conversion rate across all platforms by X percent by the end of Q2. And the conversion rate is currently this much on mobile and on desktop. Now we did a lot of research as well to compare this to, to typical conversion rates around other e-commerce sites. And we found out ours is really low. It was terrible. So we had to fix it. So we had a benchmark of where we needed to get to. So now we use something called the product kata to kind of experiment through that. And what the product kata does is it takes that target condition that you're looking at and it aligns you to start experimenting towards it. So you know where you are, you know where you have to go, and you start asking your team questions. So every day or every week when we ran an experiment, we would say, what's the next thing we need to learn? What's the next obstacle standing in our way of reaching the target, uh, target condition? And we broke down that obstacle, and then we ran an experiment to tackle it. And then after we ran that experiment, we reflected, we did a retrospective, measured our current condition, and repeated it. So it looks something like this. Our first obstacle was we have no idea why people are leaving the site. Why are they falling off at this one spot? And it was really hard to get this information. So our e-commerce site was, um, we, we weren't capturing any emails or phone numbers when people were signing up, only after they actually purchased. So we had no way to get in touch with people who dropped off. And we spent a good few weeks racking our brains on how to get in touch with people. And one day, my developer said, hey, I found this thing called Qualaroom. And what we can do is just put some JavaScript on our site, and it will slide up from the bottom like this and say, what's stopping you from signing up today as people go towards the back button on that page where everyone's falling off? And I looked at this, and I said, that is phenomenal. <laughs> like, this is what we really need. But I also went, I don't know if we should have this open text box. Like, 
maybe we should do a survey. We'll get more, more answers there. He goes, well, I can change this in five minutes, so let's just put it up there. I said, fine, whatever. By the end of the week, we had 400 responses. And none of them said, I want a free knife. All of them <laughs> were, to, like, were very common reasons that we just missed about why people weren't setting up. The biggest thing, 33% of people, I can't find the menu. I have no idea what food you're sending me. Is it vegetarian? Is it fish? Do I have to refrigerate it? What, what's going on? Next one, almost as much people. What's in the box? Do you send everything? Do I have to go buy eggs? Are you gonna send me an egg? Like, how does that work? Then we got people saying the price is too high, but that was only about 15%. 15% of people were saying the price was too high, but they were saying, I don't understand why you're more expensive than your competitors. They weren't saying right off the bat, you know, this is too much money. They were saying, explain to me why. And it was because we had organic food, it was different types of high quality meats, but we weren't explaining it. So we took all this information and we said, let's start with the first biggest problem, the easiest one to solve really, people can't find the menu. Now, we had a whole page describing what people could order for the next month and had all of those things on there, but they weren't finding it. So we said, let's run one first experiment where we put on that page where they're dropping off, this is a page, these little links to that information and see if they click on it and if it helps. Good experiment. The reason we went with this experiment is because it was easy and because we had a lot of stakeholders who didn't want us toying with the rest of their site. So this actually didn't solve our problem. And what we found was a couple people signed up, but we were missing the bigger picture. And this is where I see a lot of teams run into trouble experimenting. We do what is easy instead of what is right. So we took it down after a week. I went back, I argued with the stakeholders because the real problem we had was this explore button. So if you look on the top right hand corner up there, that's called a hamburger menu. And what happens with a hamburger menu is that we hide all the good information in there and nobody clicks on it. So only 5% of people coming to the site clicked on that and that's where the menu was. So we ran an experiment. We said, let's just expand that. We didn't have a lot of pages. This was a long scroll type website but we said, let's just take what we have. We can do this in one week. We put it up there and it said menus, FAQs and help. That's all we had. FAQs and help, they weren't really beautiful pages. The creative director was arguing with me. It's ugly, I won't put that up there. It's my reputation. You know, like she was just not happy about it at all. But I said, if we can get 33% more people to sign up because we have an ugly menu, I'll be happy with that, right? I'm gonna make some more money. We put it up our conversion rate skyrocketed, right? Doubled instantly in one week because of that little change, that little thing. So what we did is we went back and we refined it so that we added more information and we did it piece by piece. We iterated on it until we had a comprehensive front of the house website that looked great. And we did this step by step and it only took us about a month to get there. But instead of rushing into putting knives in boxes and lowering our prices and doing all that, we didn't have to. We just had to experiment and we had to figure out what was standing in our way of doing that. So that's the moral of product strategy. So product strategy, it's not a set plan. It emerges from experimentation and we have to balance having a good idea of the vision and where we wanna go and how we're gonna get there through experimentation. And that's how we figure out how we build great products for our customers. So learning, we have to remember, reduces this uncertainty in product development. The more we learn, the better our products become because we're lowering the risk it takes to ship it out and know if it's successful. So we wanna focus on learning as much as we can about what will be successful in the market before we commit to building the whole thing. But we have a problem because now that lean startup is out there, Everybody thinks experimenting is the new black, right? It's a cool new thing to do. And we're not running great experiments. Like I told you in my first version of that experiment, we did what was easy instead of what is right. And it's really easy to game certain experiments. So um, I was talking to one insurance company before and they had done a big transformation trying to get into lean techniques and they were running experiments. And I went in to talk to the team. And I was talking to the manager and I said, 
what are you testing? What's your hypothesis? And he said, if users engage with the site more, then they will buy a second insurance policy. I said, great, good hypothesis. That's what we really need to. His tests, though, were pop-ups that led users to insurance policies, and his success was them clicking on it, not necessarily purchasing them. So we do this all the time with experiments, where we try to put something up there to engage a user and have them click on things, but we're not measuring whether they're purchasing things at the end of the day. And there's a lot of reasons why we do this. It's easy to measure this way, and it looks good when we show them to our bosses. So Jim, who was our executive manager, looked at all the numbers for clicking on the pop-ups, and he was like, great, let's build these three features. We have all these people clicking on them. They'll be great. But at the end of the day, when you do pop-ups and people click on them, do you really know why they're clicking? If a pop-up's up there, you usually click on it to make it go away. <laughs> so we have to take a step back and remember that this type of work is experiment theater, right? This is us making it look good, making it look like we're busy and doing wonderful things, but not really focusing on the core problem. And that's a big problem when we do experimentation and when we make hypotheses. It looks good in theory, but in practice, it doesn't help us get anywhere. So you ship it out to customers and they're like, I want a refund, because it doesn't actually solve their problems. So we need to take a step back from experiment theater and concentrate on what's important. And that is outcomes over outputs. So one of the biggest problems we have in companies right now is we're measuring success on outputs instead of outcomes. So Jim is looking at these success metrics, right? He's looking at people clicking on things and he goes, oh, that number's going up. That means it's successful, right? But he's not really focusing on what are the outcomes of it. Are people buying a second insurance policy? And that is what Jim should be focusing on. He should be taking a step back, right? Um, he should be trying to figure out how do we measure success. But instead, we get into this habit where we just build and launch with no measures of success in every, all of our features. When you look at the definition of done in Agile, most of the time it's, I finished this feature and I shipped it. Right, that's it. We never go back and we never iterate. We never figure out what it is to really be successful. So we have a conveyor belt of features going out, right? Where we just shove as many things as we can in there and hope that it works at the end of the day, never really checking in on it. And that's how we look at how successful our development teams are. So we have to focus on outcomes over outputs. We have to figure out what it is we're trying to do for our business and our customers at the end of the day. Oops. So when you look at the product strategy, that's what it does, right? The vision, the challenge, and the target conditions, these are all outcomes. This is what we want to be at the end of the day. They're all related to goals, company goals, user goals. That's what we really want to do. And then the outputs we put out there help us get there. So when we start focusing on that, it gives teams room to try new things. So one of the things I like to think about, too, is the success of our, project, our products. And this is a hard thing for companies to really get in the habit of. People ask me all the time, how do I become um, a company that focuses on outcomes? How do I get into startup mode? So I was talking to Jeff Patton about this. And he does this really fun thing at the beginning of his workshops. And he says, I have everybody line up from one end of the room to the other. And I say, if you're Last product launch was successful, really successful, like blew everybody out of the water, go over there. If your uh, product launch was not that successful, go over there, if it was a ter total, bleh, terrible failure. And what happens is we usually get about, this, we get about 20% over here and awful, 20% and awesome, and then we get most of the people somewhere in the middle in what I'm calling the valley of meh. Go back here. Damn it, sorry. <laughs> um, there was a joke in there and I screwed it up. The Valley of Meh, okay? So the Valley of Meh is where most of our projects e end. And when you look at that, you have to start thinking why, right? Um, and when I come to companies and I do experiment techniques, a lot of them go, I want to be a, like a startup. I want startup mentality. So they bring in like pool tables and couches and stuff. But when you do look at startups and the success of their products, they measure them by outcomes. And success for a uh, startup is very different than success for a big company. So when you ask anybody who lines up in that Valley of Met, did you get fired or was it not successful? No, right? Like nobody's losing their job over meh 
at big companies because we have enough money to stay afloat. So failure is a very, very tiny little piece of what we do in companies. We have so much money, we can ship whatever we want. But in startups, it's inverted, right? If you're not awesome, you're not gonna stay in business. Somebody else will come in and sweep you, sweep you up because they have money. So we need to start focusing like a startup. You have to start me um, measuring yourself by the outcomes of what you actually put out there. One of the problems that we get into here, the last one we're gonna talk about, is a lack of focus on the real customer. Startups usually focus on the real customer when they're successful. They make sure that we're building things for them. So when I go into bigger companies, what happens is I'll ask them, what problem are you solving for your customer? And they'll say something like, customers don't have custom dashboards. And I'll say, okay, what's your solution? Custom dashboards. So, okay. <laughs> so this happens a lot, right? We, we start saying that the customer's problems are they don't have our features, right? This is the problem. Customers' problems are not lack of your product's features. Most people are not sitting there wringing their hands going, I just need this one little feature. And if they are, you need to get into the root cause problem of that and try to figure out how to build it well. Also, customers' problems are not your problems. I see a lot of people say, oh, our customer's problem is actually a business problem, like this. As a user, I want to engage with this site, but it's boring. No user is going, God, I really wish I could just engage with your site, but it's so boring. Right? They'll go somewhere else. So we have to remember that's our problem to fix. So all our users are not going to be sitting there going like, you know, that's not what they say. They'll just move on and go somewhere else. So we have to remember that you're biased. So we are biased as human beings, and what we need to do is try to eliminate that bias by figuring out how to talk to our customers. So talking directly to your users, to your customers, is the only way to kill this bias and to focus on what they want. So we need to do user research. And a lot of people talk about user research on a budget, right? User research is so expensive and we do upfront work, but that's not true. User research is the least amount of work that you could possibly do to learn about your customer. So Jeff Patton again and Gift Constable like to show this map. When we have confidence down here, and that's really low and that our end product is gonna be great, we have to do small investments to figure out how to get more confident. And user research falls down there at the bottom. Talking to a user is the least expensive thing you can do. Software is all the way up on the other end. So we have to remember that it's more important when you're not confident to do lighter weight things. Also, we have to get out of the building and talk to other people. So I love this Dilbert about talking to your, to your users, right? We interviewed hundreds of users and turned all of their suggestions into features. As it turns out, every f user we talked to was an idiot and their dumb suggestions ruined our product. In hindsight, we probably should have talked to people who work outside this building. We do this a lot. We talk to our colleagues. We say, do you like this? And they're like, yeah, sure, it looks great. And we're never talking to people outside because we don't want to go through the effort or we don't want to take the time to go out there or we're afraid to talk to strangers. But that's not how we actually get into a good mode of learning about our customers. So you have to remember that your colleagues are not your customers. They're not buying your product at the end of the day. Unless you're building internal tools, then they are. Go talk to them. So one other thing I hear too is, but Melissa, our users don't know what they want. It's not your user's job to know what they want. It's their job to know what the problem is. It's your job as a product manager to figure out what they want. It's your job as a development team to create the right solution. And solving big problems for customers creates big value for businesses. So we need to get closer to our customers and understand that. So John Deere is a great company that really takes this to heart. They created a mock farm up in Iowa near their, near their, um, their campus where all the engineers can go out and learn how to use their tools. They send everybody there who comes from software up to use their tools and their tractors because they know that they come from big cities and they don't know what farmers are like. So they have this great culture where they built things around it for people to learn about their customers. Disney does the same thing. Disney sends all of their employees into the park every day to go talk to customers, to see what they're doing, to observe it. So these big companies are successful because they're taking the time to really, really learn about their customers. And they know it's worth it to spend that money and that energy doing that because that's what sets them apart. That's what makes them successful. So 
what we have to do is have this process of both discovery and delivery feeding into each other. When we talk about product management and agile, we need to be learning and then building, and then learning and building, and iterating based off what we learn. So at the beginning of this talk, I said, how did we get here? How did we end up with all these product managers hating agile, a lot of product owners just managing a backlog and not thinking about what goes into it, nobody's experimenting? Well. When we think about those product managers, right, and how they're learning about Agile and what message we're saying to them, we have to look at what people understand as Agile. And I don't hear a lot of people talking about those manifesto principles. I always, I always ask people, I'm like, how many of you have read the 13 principles? How many of you have read the 13 principles in Agile Manifesto? Okay, not everybody. So here's the thing, those things really get to the core. And instead of focusing on the core and the principles, we start, doing things like this, right? Where we have this giant map of all these processes. And we have large consultancies and large, um, large agile firms too selling these processes. We'll make you faster, we'll make you more money, we'll make you do things. And while that's good, and while we want companies to be faster, we also have to remember that there's other pieces to it. So when we get into these companies too, where all they care about is velocity and story points, I hear a lot of people in agile go, well, they just don't understand Agile. And they get so dismissive, and I hate that, because where did they learn Agile, right? They learn it from us. And if you are a coach or a teacher of Agile, you have to remember that they learn it from us, and it's on us if people don't understand. So we have to focus on these principles. We have to remember that our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And we have to remember who that customer is, right? And when we go into product owner training, a lot of times, this is, this is what you'll learn as a product owner in most class, classes CSPO. We talk about project charters and defining backlogs and applying a method, method, bleh, methodical approach, getting a clear view and producing accurate plans. Like, that's not all of product management. We have to remind people that you need more than a $29 certification that you can get online. $29 these days. <laughs> so, that's not, so that's what we have to focus on. If you are a coach or a leader or somebody in an Agile organization, you have to be talking about that. I also hear a lot of people say, do we even need product owners? If that's what they're learning, right, just to manage a backlog and put things in the right priority and put a story point on it and give it to a developer, no, we don't need product owners. We don't need product owners writing 40 hours worth of user stories. A team can do that, I agree with that. But what we do need is product people who know how to make valuable software by recognizing uncertainty. We do need good product owners and product managers who balance both business and customer value and make those hard choices and align the team and figure out what's really valuable and help us experiment through the unknown. That's what we need to make great software. So, yep. Agile is not enough to get us out of the build trap. We need more. We need an emergent product strategy made up of goals, constraints, and actions that result in desired outcomes. We need a process that allows us to experiment towards a desired outcome. And we need empathy for the customers that buy and use our product. That's what we need to get out of the build trap. But the problem is, it's really comfortable to stay in the build trap. So I'm gonna leave you with this. What can you do to help yourselves get out of it? So thank you very much. So two, two more notes before we start with questions. Um, if you want these slides, email me at melissa at sendyourslides.com and put Quebec in the subject, and it will automatically send you all these slides. Um, I also teach an online product management school that you can sign up and start right away. It's at productinstitute.com, and you can take 15% off if you put Agile Quebec in there. So we have a lot of coaches who will help you through this, a lot of people from Agile backgrounds, learning great product management foundations. And I'm writing a book. It is actually more in progress. It's been pushed off a lot. But Escaping the Bill Trap should be coming out by the spring. All right. Merci beaucoup. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Melissa. Merci. Thanks. This is so interesting to hear all your stories. I would love to hear more. Uh, but we'll leave uh, people uh, for questions. Est-ce que vous avez des questions? On a placé deux micros pour uh, bien vous entendre en salle. On comprend qu'on est un grand groupe, mais on a accès à cette dame uh, quelques minutes. 
OK, alors je vous invite à vous approcher, s'il vous plaît. Juste ici, vous l'avez juste à votre gauche. Et si quelqu'un d'autre veut une autre question, parce qu'on aura peu de temps tout de même, vous pourrez déjà vous avancer à l'autre micro. Thank you for your presentation, because I think uh, what you explained today is a concern that we have here in our company, and I think many companies have this problem. But I think the other things I was thinking about uh, understanding the problems is also uh, removing the communication path that is in between a customer and the people who build mm -hmm. the product. And I think it's not just a matter on getting a good product manager, as you explained. It's also to making sure that the people who build the product, the engineering team, the developers, also be in contact with the customer so they understand this problem as well. Sure. I mm -hmm. think this is what also needs to be uh, addressed to be, I mean, to address this kind of problem from the customer. That's what I need to say. Okay. Do you have a question? Or? That's my... Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. Um, I, when I teach in my class, I teach that every product manager should bring their developers out to their interviews. So when I was working at that company where we learned Agile, um, my developers were really into experiments. We started all the lean startup practices there. So I took them to all of my um, interviews with me. We'd rotate. Some people would ask questions. I trained them on how to do good interviews so they would go and do them themselves as well. Um, designers, everybody participated. And what I loved about it was when we got back in the room to discuss what to do, anytime somebody would come up with a bad idea, one of our developers would be like, no, Mary said that she would never do that. Like, you are wrong. I heard Mary say this. And we're like, woof. Like, they really fought for it. So I, I always thought like that was one of the best things to do. And I always encourage like my team, I have a lot of UX designers right now I'm training as well, who are complaining that they have to do all the research. I'm like, no. You are accountable for the outcomes of the research. You have to make sure people can do it well, but anybody who can participate in research or conduct it, as long as they know how to ask good questions and learn the things they want to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Merci pour la question. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres interventions? Do you, do you see it um, being easier in small companies than in big companies when you have a lot of hierarchy? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So how do, how do yeah. you make it work when there's so many people in the company? Yeah, um, this is one of my biggest challenges right now. So I'm working with a team in Boston. They have 350 product managers who have never been product managers, 350 scrum teams, like seven product lines, and they have eight levels of management. Oh my God. So what happens is they have bad practices, right? And you start from the top, mm. and they'll say, build this feature, and it travels down six levels until you can only build this feature, right? And what we're trying to do is bring everybody up and get the top layers. One, we're trying to flatten the org a lot, because I believe if the flatter you have an org, um, mm. the easier it is to experiment and focus people around those organizations. So we're trying to carve out little areas where people can have autonomy but still collaborate with other product lines. And then we're trying to focus all the managers on outcome-oriented stuff. So we're starting at the top. We have great buy-in yeah. from the CEO, which is amazing, which usually doesn't happen. But I think in large orgs, you need to have that layer of management above the scrum teams be completely invested in moving this way. So you have an influence also on the management yes. of an organization mm -hmm. based on what you're doing. Uh, je vois pas personne au micro, alors là-dessus, on va s'arrêter parce qu'on voudra prendre une pause. Thank you Thank so you. much. We'll take a break. Thank you so Thank much. You. you can get your applause. It's for you. <laughs> Merci. Thank Merci. you very much.